just have a, a, a review of some of the highlights. I didn't put everything that we covered on there. Uh, I didn't put last week's stuff because we just went over it, but I kind of put some of the things that I thought would be. Do you have your hand up? Yeah, it would take a while. It would take a while. Loving lessons. Uh, but I put, I guess, the greatest hit, some of the highlights that I thought would be good for us uh, to go over and be reminded of. So we're going to do a review here in just a moment. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we do give you thanks this morning that we can be a people of prayer that we can come into your presence this morning, that we can open our Bibles. Father, we're here because of you. May we be led by your word. May we be strengthened by what it says, Father. May we grow in our knowledge of your word. May this time of study for this topic, may it have been beneficial to us, Father. May we have grown in our understanding of your providential hand and how great you are at working in the world today. As always, Father, we're thankful for Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, we've been using the same definition for providence as we've been working our way through this study. And providence there on your outline is this. It's the means by which God directs all things. Providence, get, I'll, I'll finish it, but, but providence shows us the hand of God. Providence shows us that the world just wasn't wound up, set loose, and we're out here all on our own. Providence shows us that God is very much involved in our lives. He's at work in the world today. So it's the means by which God directs all things, seen and unseen, good and evil. And we talked about how God works providentially at times through evil um, toward a worthy purpose. There's some intent to the providence of God. There's a reason for the providence of God. God is accomplishing something. God is bringing something to fruition, if you kind of think about it that way. He's bringing something uh, at times to a conclusion. Think about Joseph and, and everything that culminated in him being a second in charge in Egypt. So um, God, through providence, is working in the world today. Then we talked about there's two types of providence. There is the first one, which is called general providence. And general providence is the way in which God exercises control over, or excuse me, uh, the, the widespread care and supervision which God exercises over all his creation within the laws of nature. Providence works within the laws of nature. Anything outside of the laws of nature would be a miracle. So God is guiding things uh, within the laws of nature. His general providence is for everyone. Okay? His general providence uh, falls upon all people. The second type is what we call special providence. And this is the care and supervision which God exercises over and in behalf of those whose wills are in harmony with his divine will. This is God's care exercised toward his faithful children within the laws of nature. Well, uh, providence is always within the laws of nature, whether it's general or whether it's special. But special providence is those things that God does for the faithful. Now, somebody raised the question to me. I can't remember who it was. You can raise your hand. If you, this is weeks and weeks ago. Well, doesn't that show that God is... I thought the Bible said that God doesn't show favoritism. Well, if there's a difference between general providence and special providence, is God showing favoritism? No. God is showing that he works separately in those who are saved and those who are lost. God is saying that there are certain blessings that come to those who are saved where those who are lost don't receive. Those who are saved receive the forgiveness of their sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Those who are lost don't receive it. Now, can they? Well, certainly they can. Certainly they be, can become a Christian and have their sins forgiven, but they don't enjoy the forgiveness that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. But those who are saved do. It's, that's right. They choose not to. So it's God operating in different areas, if you'll kind of think about it that way. Uh, God operating in different ways depending on the situation in that person's life. So special providences are for those who are faithful children of God. 
So that's kind of the working definition that we've been using when it comes to providence in, in this study. Um, the second thing there on your outline is the three types of God's will. And this just gives us categories in which the will of God is at work. Three uh, general ways, if you will. Three, um, oh, how do I want to say it? Three major ways, I guess you could say, that God's providence is at work. Yeah, the first one is the intentional will of God. Um, this is what God specifically desires to happen. Go over to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18 and beginning in verse 14. Even so, it is even so, it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God wants people to be saved. That is God's intentional will. Uh, 1 Timothy, oh goodness. Oh, 2 4. Oh, God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. It's in there. <laughs> but God, that's God's intentional will that all people would be saved. The next type is what we call a circumstantial will. Um, this requires a little bit more application. The circumstantial will of God is God's plan within certain circumstances. So, so his intentional will is, I want everybody to be saved. His circumstantial will is, well, things have changed. Now I've got to operate in a way in the lives of people that's different from my intentional will. I'll give you an example. Go over to Numbers. Turn back to your Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers chapter 20. And beginning in verse 7, and you'll be familiar with this story as we work our way through it. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, that's the key, speak to the rock, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rock from before the Lord, or Moses took the rod, from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord, did you see what he did? God said, Speak to the rock. And what did he do? He struck the rock. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given you. So now it's God's circumstantial will. What was his intentional will? That they all go to the promised land. That Moses and Aaron take the people, lead them into the promised land. Now his circumstantial will is, because you did something that was wrong, now my circumstantial will is in play. So now, instead of going into the promised land, now you don't. Okay? So it's God working in a way in which, if you think about it this way, man is the producer of the circumstantial will. When God's intentional will is obeyed, right? When God's intentional will is obeyed, then everything goes according to God's plan. When things, when man doesn't go according to God's plan, then his circumstantial will is in place. All right? You speak to the rock. They struck the rock. Here's the penalty. You don't go into the promised land. Okay? It's, 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 it speaks to obedience. It's not God um, sitting back saying, oh, now I got you. Now, I, you know, you're not going to get to go to the promised land. It's certainly God wanting everybody to go to the promised land, but it's the understanding that there's a consequence for not obeying God. Yes. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So it, it, it came down to a matter of obedience. Did they obey or disobey God? Well, they disobeyed God. So it leads to a larger discussion. Does our obedience to God matter? Well, 
it certainly did in this case. Yes, sir. Russell. Well, man will always come up short if he tries to test God. Well, I, I think, you know, let me stretch the bounds, the boundaries as much as I can. You know, I, I'd say, I certainly think that's part of what we do uh, as a people. How far can I go before I violate the law of God? You know, I think we do that. I think we do that. I, I think, of course, we do it to our detriment. Nothing good is going to come from violating the command of God. It's, it's, um, my mind is stuck in Moses and Aaron. Let's, let's bring it up to, to today. No good benefit comes when, when, when I seek to disobey the will of God and I say, how close can I get before I do disobey? Nothing good is coming from that because our intention is clearly to find out how clo- close I can go before God says, well, I, I told you that was wrong. Well, sometimes we won't. Sometimes we won't see them. Sometimes we do see the effects. Uh, Adultery could cost one their marriage. You know, God says don't commit adultery. Well, how close can I get to this, you know, before it's wrong? Well, you obviously got too close. You committed adultery. And now the consequence can be your marriage is destroyed. What were you going to say? Oh, well, yeah. Um, I don't think... uh, How do I say this? Um, I don't think anybody sits back and says, I want to sin because it hurts so bad. I don't think anybody does that. I think we sit back and we, we contemplate the idea of sin, one, because of what we think we can get out of it, and two, because we're going to enjoy it. I don't think anybody says that. It's painful, hurtful. It's going to destroy my life. It's no good. I'm going to be miserable about it. Hey, let me do that. Uh, I think it's seeing how far we can go uh, before we reach that limit. Now, yeah, there's, there's something to be said for temptation. Everybody doesn't give in to temptation. So there is something to be said. That there are those times that we come close. We come close. You know, I was, I was tempted to take the drink. You know, I was, I was tempted to do this, but I, you know, better wisdom prevailed or my understanding of what the scriptures say prevailed. You know, my relationship with God prevailed. My prayers were effective and they prevailed. And so I came back from that level of temptation. But God's circumstantial will is in place because of what man did. Okay? Man did something. All right? the, the, the third type of God's will is his ultimate will. So intentional will is this what I want, this is what I want to happen. His circumstantial will, this is what has to happen now because of an, an action. His intentional, his ultimate will is this is what's going to take place. Uh, I'll give you an example. Go over to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 23. I'm going to give you more than just verse 23. We'll go down to verse 26. Usually we just stop at 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We, We get that, okay? But notice what Paul says. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. Ultimately, a relationship with Jesus Christ will an obedient relationship to Jesus Christ uh, leads to one salvation, leads to righteousness. Not because of we're righteous, righteous because, but because Christ is righteous. And so the ultimate 
outcome of that is God's finality of his will is achieved. God desires that all men to be saved. Well, all men don't want to be saved. Ultimately, through the blood of Jesus Christ, anyone who chooses can be saved. It's like um, Matthew was saying. It comes down to the choice of free will. You either choose or you don't choose. It's, it's, the responsibility is on us. Uh, I don't think it's fair for us to sit back and say, God didn't force me to do it. Well, God's not going to force you to do it. Or God tricked me into do it, doing it. God's not going to trick you into doing it. You know? Oh, well, that's why we have free will. But, but it's, it's a choice on our part to serve or not to serve God. Okay? And so it's a choice whether or not we're going to obey the will of God or whether we're going to disobey the will of God. It's like I always say, nobody's going to, you know, nobody can go out into their backyard at night and lift their fist to the sky and say, you made me do it. Whoa, wait a minute, time out. I didn't make you do anything. You chose. You chose. Um, so we see those three types of God's intentional will. The next one is what we call the certainty or the uncertainty of providence. And that's kind of been a general um, theme as we've worked our way through all of this. We've seen the certain providence of God and the uncertain providence. Um, there's the principle of perhaps, and you'll remember Queen Esther where, um, um, I want to say Mordecai, Haman, uh, Haman, Haman. Haman says, if, uh, perhaps, you know, this is why you're here. Perhaps you're the one. Mordecai. Mordecai. Perhaps. Sorry. Mordecai. Per, perhaps. I had Haman a good guy. Wow, that was bad. Yeah, man. Uh, he wore the dark cowboy hat, and Mordecai wore the white cowboy hat. Now I remember. But Mordecai said to Esther, well, maybe this is why you've come. Yeah, for such a time as this. Perhaps that's the reason. Now, then he goes on and says, if it's not you, and this shows the faith of Mordecai, if you're not the one, God's going to raise somebody up. Mordecai's faith was the Jews are going to be saved. It doesn't mean they won't face persecution. Doesn't mean Haman couldn't have killed a whole lot of them. But Mordecai said, if it's not you, Esther, it's going to be somebody. So you, you have the understanding of the principle of perhaps. Did you have your hand up? They're going to be saved either way, but for all we know, it's going to be you. That's right. Um, go over to Acts chapter 18 and verse 21. Then there's the principle of the Lord willing. If it's in God's purpose, if God wants it to take place, okay, um, and this is dealing with, in, in Acts chapter 13, uh, but took leave of them saying, I must, this is Paul, I must by, by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return to you again, God willing, and he sailed from, for, from, uh, for, from Ephesus. If it's God's will, I'll, I'll be back with you. If, it, if it's God's will, this is the, the principle of the Lord willing. If it's God's will, then may his providential hand guide me back to you. Okay, Paul is open to the providential work. Paul doesn't say, oh, well, we had our shot. You know, I can't make it. Probably never going to see you again. Paul says, you know, it could be that, that this is what the Lord wants to happen for now. But if he wills, he'll bring us back together. Okay, it's being open to that. Then a third thing that we talked about is when we talk about divine providence that is knowable. And the best example of that is Joseph in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, where he says to his brothers, you meant this for evil, but God meant what they did to him, throwing him in, selling him into slavery. You meant it for evil, right? But God used it for good. And so, and the thing that I've always highlighted, I know I've highlighted it, is I, I, I don't think it's fair to say that when Joseph was in the midst of it, Joseph wasn't saying, oh, well, I'm not going to sweat it. This is God's providence. It's only at the end, looking back, that Joseph says, now I see it, right? When he was in prison, 
He wasn't saying, oh, it's okay that I'm here suffering. It's God's providence. He wasn't saying that. When, when he was running from Potiphar's wife, he wouldn't say, oh, well, this is the providence of God. Oh, it's okay. Nothing bad's going to happen. It's, it's Joseph looking back and saying, you know, I, I see the hand of God. It's knowable. It's discernible. I see how God has been working all this time. Here I am, second command of all of Egypt. I'm able not only to save my family, but I'm able to save all these people from this famine. Okay? It's him looking back and seeing that. So um, there's providence that is certain, and there's providence that is uncertain. Any questions or comments? Class isn't over, Roberta. You've got to stay. Take your shirt off and give it to her, Russell. <laughs> we don't want to see that, Russell. Never mind. Um, a third thing that we've talked about is the attributes of God's providence. So these are specific qualities and characteristics. That's what an attribute is. An attribute helps us understand something. An attribute explains something to us. Remember, if you're sitting here in the auditorium and you hear barking outside, you don't think moose. You don't think cat. If you hear barking, you think dog because barking is an attribute, a characteristic of a dog. Well, these are characteristics. These are attributes of God. Here's the first one when we talk about God's providence. God's providence is holy because God is holy. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 1. I probably won't have time to go through every one of these. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. So God's providence is always holy. It's always good. It's always holy, because that's an attribute of who God is. Secondly, God's providence is just, because God is just. Go over to the 119th Psalm. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And uh, what do I give you? Uh, 137. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. So God is just, uh, providence is just because God is just. Thirdly, God's providence is, ben providence is benevolent because God is benevolent. Stay there in the Psalms. Go over to Psalm 145. And look at verse 9. Psalm 145 and verse 9. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his work. That's a way of saying God is a benevolent God. God is a giving God. God is a compassionate God. God is a God who takes care of his creation. God is a God through his providence who acts benevolent, benevolent, good. Number five, number four, God's providence is wise because God is wise. Uh, Proverbs chapter two. You're in Psalms, just turn forward one book. Proverbs chapter two and verse six. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. So God is a God of wisdom. So his providence is wise. Um, God doesn't make a mistake in his providence. Well, God doesn't make mistakes in anything. But God doesn't say, oh, I really thought this providential work would have been a good thing. Turns out it wasn't. Um, that's not our God. Okay, that's not the God we worship. Um, and then number five, God's providence is sure because God is sure. That's what the psalmist is saying in Psalm 119. God is a sure and certain God. So his providence will be sure and certain. Um, in, in all of these, there's of course, there's benefit to us as a people of faith, but there's encouragement. God's providence doesn't set out to cause us any type of harm. God's providence being holy is to our benefit, you see. 
God's providence in being just blesses us. God's providence in being benevolent helps us. God's providence in being wise helps us. God's providence in being sure is a blessing to us. So all of these characteristics are going to be those things that are good for us in our life. God's providence is working about in a way in our life through the laws of nature, within the laws of nature, in which a beneficial effect is achieved. Okay? A beneficial check. Uh, now, do you think we can refuse God's providence? I think so. Disobedience would set aside the providence of God. God may open the doors, but that doesn't mean we walk through it. God may allow for something to be taking place, but we can say, you know what, I don't want it. So uh, we're, we're not um, robots where we're forced to do what God wants us to do. And ultimately, you see in that the love of God. Because God saying, listen, I want you to choose to obey me because it's what you want to do, not because I forced you to do it. I want you to choose to do it because you love me. And so it's God working in us providentially. Um, the next thing there, if you flip your outline over, Matthew has made mention of this. It's the biblical doctrine of free will. And a good working definition of free will is this. The ability to choose your own path. That's key. The ability to make your own decisions. The ability to exercise your own will. God's providence works in harmony and never against man's free will. Okay? Um, it's our choice to do what we want to do. It's our choice. Okay? We can't blame God. It's our choice that we did. Here's the first thing. You see the, the example of man's free will in action. You see Adam and Eve. Um, they're free to obey God or not obey God. In Genesis chapter 2, you know the story. They're free to say, you know what? God said, don't eat of the fruit of this tree of good and knowledge. So I'm not going to eat of it. Or they had the free will to say, I'm going to eat of it. God didn't prevent them. God asked them not to, but God didn't prevent them from doing it. And I always get, um, through the years, and usually it comes from younger kids, and it's a great question. Um, if the tree was so bad, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was so bad, then why did God put it in the garden? Somebody. The, you have a choice. You have a choice. God put it there so that you had a choice. Adam and Eve can't say, you made us be faithful. No, you had a choice whether or not you were going to obey me. You had a choice. You and Jesus had a choice. That's what we were tempted in the wilderness. He had a choice whether to do what Satan told him or to resist him. That's true, Matthew chapter 4. That's true. So you see man's free will in action. Adam and Eve um, chose to do what they do. Um, go over to 2 Peter chapter 2. Turn there towards the end of your New Testament. 2 Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse 4. And I think one of the things, and I had a few questions about this when, we were, when I was covering it. I, I think w one of the things that we have to remember is that humanity is not the only creation of God that's given free will. Uh, God created the heavenly hosts. And God created them, angels, they're not part of humanity, they're separate. God created them with the ability to have free will. And you see that at play here in 2 Peter 2 and verse 4, where it says, for if God did not spare the angels who, what's it say? Sinned but cast them down to Hades, is the word there, not hell, and delivered them into Taurus, is actually the word, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Angels had a choice whether or not to be faithful or disobedient. They had a choice. That's right. That's right. So 
you, you see that even angels were, were given this ability to freely choose to obey God or to disobey God. So what did they choose to do? They cho- chose to commit sin. Sin is a violation of the law of God. Sin is a violation of what God has said he wants us to do. Okay, So you see that taking place. And then when we talk about free will, we see that God worked alongside man's free will. Another example that I give, I give you again is, um, is the one of Esther and Haman and Mordecai. Um, God used Esther to save the Jews. God worked alongside uh, man's free will. He didn't violate man's free will. He didn't force man to act in a way. Um, he, he worked alongside Esther. Remember what Esther does? She goes into the king. She's not supposed to, but she does. She goes into the king. She puts herself at the mercy of the king. You know, that's her free will. And of course, she found favor with the king and, and, and the Jews are ultimately uh, saved. So that's the doctrine of, of free will. Free will is important. Um, Free will is a big issue today. If you, oh, Casey, who's that heretic you're reading right now? Um, N.T. Wright. <laughs> Casey's reading a book and I'm being mean to him about it. Um, uh, I was just thinking, R.C. Sproul, who's dead. N.T. Wright. Um, who else? They're, they're, they're Calvinists. Uh, they believe in total hereditary depravity, that man is born a sinner. Um, so they would say it's not your free will. Um, you were born that way. Okay, You were born a sinner. And it's really at the heart of whether or not we're people who accept free will or who deny free will. Well, Calvinists deny free will. Right? You don't choose to sin. You were born a sinner. Okay? Right. Yes. Well, I I thought I put it in the providence. Yes, it would. I thought I listed that. Yeah, the providence, certain and uncertain. Um, the principle, perhaps, with Queen Esther. Yes. It would be the providence of God. I, I believe wholeheartedly it would be in the providence of God. Yeah. Anybody else? I just think the, like, Sarah, Sarah, and Moses, and the Second of Ezra, like, I think it's the scriptures, if I remember correctly, it says, like, God said that he would part the Pharaoh's heart. Right. God allowed Pharaoh to do what Pharaoh wanted to do. Pharaoh's heart was corrupted. God allowed it. He didn't stop it. He didn't send a providential way to prevent it. He said, if this is how, if this is how Pharaoh's going to act, I'm going to let Pharaoh act that way. God, God tr- gives us every available opportunity to do what's right. But there are those times where he says, okay, if that, let me give you an example. Go over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. When we talk about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, how God let him do the things that he wanted to do, uh, go down beginning in... Do what? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, think about this. For God's wrath, uh, verse 18, Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against, un- against all ungodliness and unrighteousness righteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. And then keep, God has shown them what's right. Um, then verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Verse 24, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. God said, if that's what you want to do, then go do it. God said to Pharaoh, if that's how you're going to act, then go act that way. God exercising, God allowing them to exercise their free will. God didn't say to Pharaoh, you have to do this, and I'm commanding it of you. God knew Pharaoh's heart and said, make your choice. Do what you want to do. Um, and he did it. The same thing as these folks in Romans chapter 1. He, he, he gave them up. This is what you want to do? Then go ahead and do it. Um, the same thing would be true today. The same thing would be true today. God is saying to us, if that's what you want to do, then does he want us to do evil? Well, of course he doesn't. But God is a God who exercises that, allows us to exercise our free will. We'll say, if this is what you want to do, then you're free to do it. He has sent every possible means for us to be a people of faith. Every possible means up to the extent of sending his only begotten son to die for our sins, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John chapter 3 and verse 16. But not everybody chooses to believe in Christ. Not everybody chooses. God has given us every means to be saved. But there's people in the world who don't take it, who don't want it. So we see that. Um, God's providential hand in benevolence. We, we covered those different ways in which God uh, works through different things. God provides for the poor and needy through Christians. He provides uh, through local churches to provide for the needy. Uh, he works through families to provide for needy family members. He works through government to provide for the needy. All these are ways in which God's benevolent hand can be seen. Um, then the next one there, how Paul understood providence. Um, I spent a lot of time on that one because, of course, Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. And if we're going to see God's providential hand, surely we're going to see it in the writing of Paul. Right? And it shows up. And there's several things that we learn about providence from Paul. One, providence isn't discouraged by difficulties. God doesn't say, oh, I tried, but it got too hard. His providence isn't discouraged by that. Providence touches the ordinary affairs of man. In Acts chapter 18, verse 19 to 21, all it talks about is Paul making a journey. Paul making a journey. God's there. If the Lord wills, if it's his thing, God works through the, the ordinary affairs of man. Uh, providence offers opportunities for erring men to obey God. Uh, you see that time and time again. Uh, the Philippian jailer. Uh, could it be any more providential than having Paul there? I mean, could you ask for anybody better to teach you the gospel than the Apostle Paul? Uh, providence opened doors for the furtherance of the gospel. Um, the Gentiles being evangelized in Acts chapter 14. Um, uh, Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, through persecution, uh, the gospel is spread. It goes into all the world. And then providence safely guides the future of all who trust in God. Um, asking for the will of God to guide Paul to Rome. Romans 1 and verse 10. These are examples from Paul's life. Romans 15, 29 through, through 33. You know, God, if it's your will, may I go. If it's your will, uh, may this happen. If it's your will, may this come to be. So you see providence in the life of Paul. The last thing there is suffering and providence in Scripture. Um, providence doesn't negate that there's there can be pain and suffering. Okay, Just because God's working providentially doesn't mean everything's always going to be rosy. Uh, another example I give you there is Joseph. Everything wasn't rosy in his life. The other example I give you is the church, Acts chapter 8 and verse 3, persecution. But you see through that persecution, the gospel begins to spread. So, so God works providentially through those things that we would say are painful that are difficult, are filled with suffering. See how I ended that right on the bell? You see that? God's will. That's providence. Oh, man.
He what? Yeah. Yeah. Did you have your hand up? Next quarter will be the book of Ephesians. Brother Ed will be teaching Ephesians.